Um, like Dale said, my name is Pat Connor. I'm with the Indiana LTAP. And um, before I came to LTAP, I've been here at the Indiana LTAP for about the last six years, but about the 12 years before that, um, my my job was bridge inspections. Um, and, you know, and bridge design as a bridge engineer. And But I spent a lot of time in that bridge asset management area. And, and some of the things, I was out there doing bridge inspections around Michigan and Indiana, seeing a lot of deterioration on bridges that was causing load postings, causing bridge closures. And, and there's a lot of simple fixes to help prevent that from happening. Um, so my goal when I came to LTAP was help to take that previous knowledge and experience and try to get the word out there on things that we can do um, to help prevent that from happening and, and increasing the life of our bridges. So before I get started here, let me just cover some bases. Uh, preservation, maintenance, preventative maintenance. Um, these are all kind of common terms kind of thrown around, um, kind of inter, inter, intermixedly. So um, when I say, if I say maintenance, I mean preservation. If I say preservation, I mean, I may mean maintenance or, or, or you know, likewise with preventative maintenance. Um, technically speaking, um, and here in Indiana, it's become kind of an issue with our funding, um, how, what we call preservation, what we call maintenance. Um, so we've kind of gotten into the weeds a little bit. So I will kind of highlight, technically speaking, preservation is something that's kind of built out of your bridge asset management plan. A lot of what Tim was talking with should resonate and you'll see kind of some duplicate information in here about being proactive versus re um, reactive. Uh, maintenance are more reactive type of treatments. They can be the same treatment, but depending on whether you do it proactively or reactively, uh, maybe consider preservation or maintenance. But for, for the sake of what we're trying to, the message I'm trying to get out here today, it doesn't really matter. You know, they're all, you know, uh, a bridge deck sealer is a bridge deck sealer. Um, a couple of key points to talk about here before we also get started, why preservation? Um, preservation number one, um, if you do the right treatment at the right time in the right place, absolutely lengthens the life of that bridge and lowers the life cycle cost. Um, research has shown that you can preserve 10 bridges to one major rehab, and we're not even talking about reconstruction. Um, I'm sure things in North Dakota are similar to here in Indiana. Um, over 90% of our bridges here in Indiana are, are local roads over waterways. So when you replace those, not only is the cost per square foot so much higher than rehab or preservation, but that area is getting much larger in a replacement project. Um, we have certain waterway permits that you have to get before you replace a bridge, same as here in Indiana. And oftentimes it's not uncommon that that length that bridge doubles in cost um, in a replacement project. So very important um, to prevent those reconstruction projects as long as possible and finding that right treatment to lengthen, lengthen the life of that. Um, also, it's the most cost of most cost effective way to manage any of our assets. Tim was talking about pavement preservation. i will talking about bridge preservation. You can apply this to um, your employees, you can apply it to your fleet and equipment. Any of the assets that you manage and own, doing some preventative maintenance is, is the most cost effective way um, to manage those. And, and kind of lastly here, it is absolutely vital and key um, to helping achieve your performance goals in your bridge asset management plan. Uh, and, you know, and I'm going to touch on the asset management part of it real quickly here um, since Tim covered it a little bit. Um, but I think, you know, as you talk to DOTs, I think a big difference between talking to a maintenance crew at a DOT level or a maintenance crew at a county level is that that maintenance crew or that director of that county highway department is, is the bridge asset management engineer and also directing the treatment activities. Where in the DOT, there's usually two, you know, the, the executive management doing the analysis, looking at the data, determining what treatments you need to do. And then the crew, all they care about is out there doing the treatments as they want. So at a local level, they're really intertwined. So it's important to understand the relationship between those. But basically what we're asked, looking for here is, you know, why preservation is, it's the best way to be a good steward of our assets and taking care of the taxpayers' dollars that we are that we are allotted. A little chart to show demonstrate um, the increase in life cycle cost. Um, as you can see here, this is a deterioration curve. Over here, you got your good, poor, bad, severe, and over time, 
and over time it's deteriorating um, to be in a worse condition. Doing some maintenance, doing some preservation up here in the fair and good categories can lengthen the life of that bridge, increasing the life, reducing the life cycle cost. We had a similar slide to this one again. Um, that deterioration curve demonstrating that window of opportunity of that right treatment in the right place at the right time. Um, up here in the preservation categories, the cost of doing those is much less than as it moves down that deterioration curve. So earlier in the life of that bridge um, is significantly cheaper than letting that bridge deteriorate to that next category. So the, the treatment in this category is not the same treatment in this category and also down here in the major rehabilitation. So there is an actual physical cost of letting that ridge deteriorate down that deterioration curve. So this is kind of a, a, a dynamic structure of our bridge asset management plan. Um, each of these elements are variables in our asset management plan that, that relate to one another. So depending on how, how, many, how much money we have coming in, depending on whether you're managing 10 bridges or 200 bridges, affects um, how much money you need to do that. Um, the condition of those bridges, if, if the majority of bridges are in good condition, will change um, the treatments that you're gonna do. I know at least here in Indiana, there's a couple counties or at least one county um, that, that is very rural, um, a very, I'll say poor, and I bet about 50% of the bridges are in poor condition. But we have a lot of other counties here in Indiana um, that have 0% of their bridges in poor condition. So it varies a lot around the state. And so that, depending on the condition of your network, will really drive how much resources are needed and what treatments are, are going to, to take place. But the key to this slide here is that, is that it's dynamic. And depending on your performance goal, depending on what trigger events uh, you, know, what, you know, when your substructure reaches a certain condition rating, what treatment are you going to do? Um, depending on how the, 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 the cost effectiveness of those treatments all play a part in, um, in, in your in dynamic and affects um, the next step in your bridge asset management plan. Uh, for the sake of this discussion, this is a, an absolutely great resource to have. Um, it's only about 20 pages long. The Federal Highway puts out a lot of good documentation, but a lot of it, I would say, is geared towards um, the DOT level. But when we're talking about local government, we're talking about counties and cities, um, this is a very straightforward, concise um, guide to help um, to understand what bridge preservation, what some different activities are, and what um, the cycles and trigger points and when those treatments are applied. So I encourage everybody to, to, to and I should have put the the link here to, to look it up, but if you just Google Federal Highway Bridge Preservation Guide, um, you should find it no problem. Within this guide, here you will see a diagram similar to this. And this is that dynamic um, bridge asset management plan that I showed previously, depending on your resources, your inventory, your condition ratings, your performance measures, all will drive what that mix of fix approach is, whether it's replacement, rehabilitation, or preservation. And they take preservation one step further and, and, and breaking that out into two separate categories, cyclical maintenance and condition-based maintenance. And again, just want to re reiterate, you can preserve about 10 bridges to one little re to one re major rehab. So very cost effective. Um, replacement. Arena's replacement is the highest cost usually got multiple elements in poor condition. When I say elements, I mean the substructure, superstructure, and, and deck. Those are the three main elements in a bridge or the culvert is the other element. Um, but so if you have a substructure in poor condition and a superstructure in poor condition, it probably makes sense to replace it. Um, but something in terms of talking about preservation, something I wanna bring up is that preservation really starts at reconstruction. Um, so it's not something that you think about after a bridge has been replaced, but be thinking about preservation at the beginning um, of a design and looking at different technologies um, that may not be the cheapest at the time of construction, but will help increase the life of that bridge over time. A couple examples of that is providing some extra concrete cover. You know, it's been proven that, that the more cover over the reinforcement takes longer for those chlorides um, to reach that steel reinforcement and cause um, that 
that steel to deteriorate in the spalling and, and deck deterioration. Also, um, galvanized rebar is becoming, at least here in Indiana and other states, an economical way of, of replacing your epoxy coated rebar. Some states are not using epoxy coated rebar, they're having some problems with it. Um, so, galvanized rebar, the technology has changed recently to where it used to be an issue with bending the galvanized and losing the galvanization around the bending of the rebar, but now the technology has, has improved to where they can bend it um, without problem in now. And also, you know, the steel beams, galvanizing your steel beams instead of painting them um, will, will help develop that 100 year bridge um, and, and increase the life of it. As far as rehabilitation goes, we're, now we're looking at um, bridges with an element, um, at least maybe just one element in poor condition. Um, so you might have a, a deck and a superstructure that's in good condition, but your substructure might be in poor condition. So this is a structural repair. It's it's more it's less costly than preservation, but less costly than re, rebuilding it. Um, so you can do some um, rehabilitation to examples of that. It's like when you have to replace the deck or replace the superstructure. And then getting into what we're here to talk about a little bit in more detail is preservation. And like I mentioned before, there's cyclical maintenance and condition based maintenance. And it's pretty self explanatory what those are. Um, cyclical, uh, well, so let's talk about preservation or activities that retard the deterioration um, so that they're not improving um, the strength of the bridge. They're not improving, they're not taking an element that is rated a four and necessarily making it an eight or a nine. Um, we're applying treatments to keep an element, you know, bridge deck an eight, an eight for longer or, you know, making it a nine and keeping it a nine for a longer to help retard the, the future deterioration of the bridges. Focal maintenance goes, these are activities that get put on a cycle. Um, so it doesn't matter what condition, you know, it's not triggered by um, necessarily an event, it's triggered just based on time. So you have different activities like cleaning and washing a bridge, a very simple bridge preservation activity put all your bridges on a one or two year rotation and go out there and clean them. Doesn't matter if they're in good, you know, if, if it needs it or not, you're out there just doing it anyway. Um, deck sealers, you know, the penetrating concrete deck sealers is another thing. Um, start that when the bridge is brand new um, and then put that on a five or 10 year cycle. On the crack sealing, every, you know, three to five years as more cracks develop, you might want to get out there and just make sure those cracks are getting filled to prevent the water and chlorides from penetrating deeper into that concrete deck. Um, and then like thin overlays, a polymer thin overlay every eight to 12 years or so are examples of cyclical maintenance. Some of these can also cross over into condition-based maintenance as well. Um, some of the condition-based treatments that are out there, you know, based on your bridge inspection reports, um, you might see that your joints have failed or need repaired. So you're out there replacing those because of the condition of those joints um, or the joint sealants coming out. And you know, you know, you got that on a note. Um, and, and hydro demoing and doing a thin overlay over your deck. You know, when that deck goes down to a condition four or five before it reaches structural problems and you want to put a new surface on there doing a hydro demo is an example of a condition based um, maintenance activity. Basically, just like in our payments, we're trying to apply that right fix in the right place at the right time. So here are some steps in developing a bridge preservation program. Um, identifying your agency's goals and objectives. You know, looking at your inventory. Remember, this is a proactive approach. We're taking a bridge asset management plan. We're looking at our data and saying, all right, about 15% of our bridges are in poor condition. Our goal is to get that down to, you know, 10%, 5%, 0% over the next five or 10 years. That is our identified goal. And then developing a plan to help achieve that. So developing a list of preservation activities that maybe that you, you know, feel like confident that your in-house crews can do, or you got a good contractor in the area that will give you a good price on a certain activity, you know, building those specific activities into your, into your program and then identify the candidates um, that would be good for preservation. And then, the, you know, that 
the six one report and improve the preservation program. I think Tim also mentioned this in the pavement side. You're not there's not the right treatment for every bridge. The more you get into it, the more you'll understand that you know the different variables or the different quality assurance measures that go into place. So this treatment may not have worked on this bridge, but it worked on this bridge. So you can continually make that program more dynamic and alter you know what those trigger points are on what treatment you do when and where and what treatments you do overall. Maybe there's a you know, treatment out there that you're not having any success at and you've tried fixing the different variables, but you're still not having success. We'll just you know, move on to another treatment. There's, there's a lot out there that you can do. So let's talk about a good place to start. Um, so like I said, evaluating reconstruction with life cycle costs in mind, looking at galvanizing your steel beams, looking at galvanized rebar, um, additional concrete thickness. When I worked in Michigan, their, their standard design for bridge deck was nine inches thick. When I moved back down here to Indiana and got into bridge design, their standard deck thickness was eight inches. So, uh, so depending on where you're at, if you're if you're at nine inches, I may not recommend going to nine and a half inches. But you know, if you're at eight inches, think about going to eight and a half inches or nine inches to help prevent this chlorides from getting deeper into your concrete deck. Also, um, bridge cleaning and washing is something very basic, very simple. Um, I know in Indiana, most of the counties are doing this already. I'm sure there's a lot of counties in North Dakota that are doing this as well. Um, but what I what I found here in Indiana is that a lot of counties say they're doing cleaning and washing the bridges, but they're not hitting all the elements. So I got a few slides to, to demonstrate that as well. Um, concrete ceiling. The next very simple, very easy thing to do. Um, polymer overlays, joint replacements, steel beam paint, um, steel beam spot painting at the beam ends. This is something that when I was a bridge inspector that I just hated seeing um, right underneath the joints within about three feet of the end of the bridge or under, underneath the joint. There was always that localized corrosion on steel beams. Um, if it was put on a cyclical basis every five years to go out there and touch up the paint, clean it and touch it up, you don't have to clean and paint the entire beam just right there at the beam ends to help preserve um, that steel from the accelerated deterioration. And then also something we just got done doing some research here at Purdue on is the concrete overlay on adjacent pre-stressed box beams. About half of our local network of bridges are adjacent pre-stressed box beam bridges. I'm sure that some of those are up in North Dakota as well, but down here in Indiana, a majority of those don't have any wearing surface on them. A lot of them, the traffic is just running right over the tops of those box beam box beams, or there's an asphalt overlay on them. So the research that we just concluded on showed that doing you don't need to before the standard practice was to drill into those um, box beams put in an anchor pour concrete deck over it and get that composite concrete deck on top of it um, the research that we just completed demonstrated that you didn't need those anchors that the adhesion of the concrete provided enough shear resistance in the concrete to adhere to those box beams and provide that composite action to help distribute that load to the adjacent beams as well as it give it additional strength. Something that, you know, again, an in-house crew often could form up a five to six inch concrete deck with just minimal temperature and shrinkage reinforcement and, and get that composite action on a bridge deck. So talking, let's get into a little bit more detail on bridge cleaning and washing. Um, again, just creating positive drainage and remove anything that holds moisture. Um, obviously, we're talking about the bridge decks um, the, the gutters, the deck drain extensions, but also where a lot of people are, were missing it here in Indiana was removing the sediment and debris from the beam ends and the bearings and the bridge seats um, on the foundations. So some of the basic equipment needed here is just, you know, whether it could be one or multiple of these brooms, power washer, um, compressed air to blow off um, that debris. Here are some of the things that when you're out there cleaning your bridge decks that you want to make sure you're getting, you're keeping those joints. That one's full of dirt and debris. It's not allowing it to expand and contract the way it was designed and meant to. Um, so it's very important to keep those um, joints um, clean and free from debris. Um, here is keeping the bridge deck surface um, clean and that positive drainage. Oftentimes in the spring, you'll see sticks or corn stalks on top of the bridge deck from a flooding event 
Um, and, and as that moisture and that water just ponds on your bridge deck, it's just accelerating the deterioration um, in those areas. So making sure that water is able to get off the bridge fastly and quickly as possible. And then underneath this drain right here, or this drain right here, there's often a deck drain extension. So now this requires your crew to get underneath the bridge a little bit and start looking at some of those elements. Um, I've, this is one of the, my pet peeves when I was a bridge inspector, is that this deck drain would not have an extension on it or it was cut short. So what you would see is accelerated, I've closed a handful of bridges or reduced the, the, the loading on them um, because there was the beams were totally ate out right here at the deck drain extension. The rest of the beam was perfectly fine, um, but with that water and chlorides hitting um, that beam, the bottom flange of that beam um, would cause that accelerated deterioration. So checking for things like that and getting it replaced. And then here is, I know these pictures may be hard to see. This here is a bearing of a bridge and you can see this is all dirt and debris that when that joint fails, it builds up dirt and debris on the beam ends and causing that accelerated deterioration. Then likewise here, you can see this concrete beam here at the end it's just spalling and breaking apart because of the moisture trap there and with the free stall cycle and water getting in there causing accelerated deterioration so keeping these areas clean with a power washer some compressed air um, serves your bridge tremendously here's another example of dirt and these aren't uncommon examples if you've never been underneath a bridge with steel beams so many times that there's just dirt and debris that accumulates on top of the abutments and here you can see a hole in the web of that steel beam and then also likewise here there's a hole right here in this beam right underneath this joint so keeping the joints sealed keeping them on um, the water from dripping down through the joints and keeping the beam ends clean is, is very good practice um, something practical you can do, very simple, is just create a simple crew checklist. And as your maintenance crew is out there cleaning and washing the bridge, um, you can develop just a little spreadsheet. And as they go out there, they can mark when they did it, when they cleaned the bridge, who was the crew leader, and they can just, after the crew is done cleaning it, um, that crew leader can just do some quality assurance and check off, okay, the deck surface is clean, the gutters are free from debris, the joints um, are clean, um, there's no deck drain extensions on this. There's no deck drains on this bridge, but if there was, you know, there's no deck drain extension. So maybe make a note, come back out here uh, at a later time and add that extension. Um, but you're kind of drilling down. So that next step would be then bridge deck preservation. So here's kind of a snapshot of the local bridges in North Dakota. Um, I got this from Federal Highway. So depending on when this data was taken, it, may determine you know how accurate this is but from what i could tell north dakota has just over 4,000 bridges um, over just over 3,000 of those bridges um, are owned and operated and maintained by by local government um, it's about 5.7 million square feet bridge deck area and here's how your good fair poor ratings came out about eight percent of your bridges had it with, based on deck area had um, a limiting condition rating of a one two three or four so it's poor. Um, your fair bridges, about 30% of your fair, and 62% of your bridges are in good condition. So what this screams to me is that you have about 92% 92, 92 of your bridges that are good candidates for preservation. <clears throat> so example of bridge deck deterioration and how you can take your data and analyze it. Um, some of the, you know, as we mentioned before, the two main you know, factors in you know, bridge deck deterioration is water and salt. And, you know, I think you guys have already seen some of this up in North Dakota already, um, seeing that white stuff fly. Um, we put the salt and brine down on the roadways. Um, and it's good for keeping the, you know, our roadway safe, but bad for our steel reinforcement and our concrete bridge decks. You know, if you, as winter maintenance crew, you want to see this you know this white you know stuff on your bridge deck showing that you have concentrated material there to prevent the bonding of ice on the roadway but as that as, as it gets wet again and seeps into the cracks that's what's causing the deterioration in our bridge decks so i took 
all you know, 3,112 bridges and, and factored out all the substructures that were a six or greater and all the superstructures that were six and greater. And this was a breakdown of the bridge deck conditions. So you had 389 um, bridge decks that were a seven, 331 that were an eight, 88 that are a nine. So all of your bridges that have a substructure greater than six and a superstructure rate greater than six were good candidates for bridge preser you know, deck preservation. And in case of a, a global pandemic, maybe those trigger factors go down a little bit. Here in Indiana, we saw the traffic on our roads redu reduced um, down to upwards of 50 to 60 percent in March and in April, which means less cars on the road, less, less gas being purchased, which means less revenue to our county highway departments. Um, so maybe we lower that threshold. Maybe instead of um, we're OK with that substructure is going to be a five for another 20 years. That superstructure is going to be a five for another 10 years. So let's lower those you know, trigger points down a little bit and see. And now we're at about half of the local network are good candidates for deck preservation. So here's how you rate a bridge deck 98765. I'm running out of time here, so I'm going fast. But nine is no defects. Eight has really tight cracking. Seven, the cracks starting to open up a little bit. And then six, we're starting to see some of the spall and delamination. So the appropriate treatments to these are concrete sealers, silanes, pore shield, um, healer sealers, they, they seal the cracks, and then the thin overlays. So here's how it lays out in your mix of fixes up here you can take your data and what bridge decks that were nine eight or seven you can see these are good candidates for the penetrating concrete deck sealers these are good candidates for the healer sealers or, or crack sealers um, so this is what it breaks down to for north dakota with bridges with the superstructure greater than five and a substructure equal to greater than five um, you have a lot of candidates I forgot to update this. Don't don't look at 17 million square feet, but um, you have a lot of half of your bridges here in North Dakota are good candidates for you know the penetrating concrete sealers, um, the healer sealers, and some polymer thin overlays. And what we want to do is prevent. So these bridges, if you remember right, we categorize a good bridge that is in seven, eight, nine, and you have. 467 bridges that are rated a seven about ready to deteriorate into a six into that fair condition. So we want to make sure we're preventing that from happening as long as possible. Um, so with that, I'll just leave you with a couple of resources. Oh, here I did leave that the website for the uh, FHWA bridge preservation guide. And also another great resource is the AASHTO TSP2 program. They have a payment preservation side and a bridge preservation side. Um, here's a link to the website. I really encourage everybody to, if you want more information, it's an absolutely great resource. But with that, that's my contact information. If anybody has any questions, I'll turn it back over to Dale. Hey, Pat, that was absolutely fantastic. And we do have a couple. We are running tight. Uh, uh, please, audience, I hope you're OK. It's a virtual lunch, so we're going to shorten it up a little bit so we can get through a couple good questions by our audience. First, Dana asks, do you have any recommendations of the type of sealer to use and uh, where to purchase the sealer? What kind of equipment could our county crew use to do this? So two, that's a great question. There's there's three that that come to mind. Um, silanes are really popular by a lot of DOTs and a lot of people out there. Um, that, you know, if you, uh, advanced chemical is, is a product that comes to mind. They're active in that TSB2 program, but there's there's a number of different silane dealers out there. Poor shield. Is one I mentioned in there that was developed by the Soy Transportation Institute. Um, so down here in Indiana, they're you know a big partner. I know in North Dakota, they're you know part of that Soy Transportation um, group as well. Um, so th they have a, a product as well. Sweet. And in North Dakota, the DOT uses simple things like weed sprayers behind a small mower that yes. uh, that work extremely oh, yeah. effectively. So it's really easy. I mean, I've, I've had more time. We've done some training in Indiana. Or you can take just like a weed, you know, like a weed sprayer and fill it up. And depending on the bridge deck area, you can just spray it right over the concrete, and, you know, and you don't have to necessarily close a bridge down very good. If you do it in the hot summer day, it takes, you know, 30 minutes for it to dry, depending on what type of silane you're using. Perfect. Pat, another question. 
I, I've got a bridge deck, needs a little work, so I'm going to put a road, uh, an overlay on the roadway, and I run right over the bridge. How important is it to reanalyze, to look at the load rating for that bridge? So if you are adding more dead weight to that bridge, I'd say it's, it's very important to work with your bridge inspectors and your load raters, um, looking at making sure you're not providing unnecessary dead load to that bridge, and maybe you could taper that you know, the approach roadway, you could taper it down at that bridge and prevent it from adding that additional dead load. Oh, great, great recommendation. And one more question before we go to break, and that is, well, lately we've been replacing a, an awful lot of our bridges with box culverts. Like the idea? Your thoughts, Pat? Yeah, um, I think box culverts are great. Um, they, I'm a big fan of concrete. They last a long time. Um, I would, you know, the only recommendation there from my from my experience is the, the dual box culverts. If you got more than one, those just seem to catch debris. Um, but if, if, if the hydraulics are adequate to fit a box culvert in there, um, I think it's, it's a good fix.